All right. Okay, so we come on to the fourth session of the day. Uh, on this session, we will focus more about the perioperative medicine. We will have four speakers, uh, all from Europe, I think. <laughs> so I believe it's good morning for all speakers. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Lohr Flossen from Germany, uh, Dr. Pedro Giro from Portugal, uh, Dr. Peter Biro from Switzerland, and Dr. Mark Boucher from France. Uh, this session is supposed to be led by Dr. Yan Ferdaus, but unfortunately, uh, he came up with some emergency this afternoon. Uh, so we will have Dr. Arif Marsawan to lead the discussion, to lead the session today. All right. So Dr. Arif, please. Thank you, Dr. Krisha. Good afternoon to all participants in Indonesia and good morning to all speakers and other participants from Europe. Uh, as Dr. Kisha has mentioned, uh, I'm the replacement for Dr. Riyad, who has taken ill uh, this morning. So it's a, an honor and a pleasure to be the chairperson uh, for this session uh, for these four distinguished speakers. Uh, Dr. Kisha has mentioned there are four speakers from Europe, from Germany, France, uh, Swiss and Portugal. Uh, uh, because of this, four speakers and uh, limited time. So unfortunately, uh, I think that uh, for Q&A session uh, directly, there won't be a, any uh, a special uh, session for Q&A, but to all the pro uh, participants who want to ask questions, please write down in the Q&A menu. And I hope uh, uh, the speakers also can write their answers in the QA menu. So for no further overdue, I would like to invite the first speaker, Prof. Rolf Roysan from Germany. He is the professor and chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology, uh, Rhenish Westfalish Technisch Hochschule Aachen. Uh, sorry for the, if I have the pronunci pronunciation uh, incorrect. It's very Please, difficult. Uh, yeah. Your time. <laughs> Please, Prof. Prof. Your, the time is yours. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your kind uh, invitation. Again, uh, to give a lecture here in uh, Indonesia, in Jakarta. Uh, for sure, it would be uh, much uh, nicer to be in Jakarta by myself, but uh, unfortunately, it's not possible. So uh, I'm glad to speak here in Germany early in the morning and to give you uh, our way uh, of choosing wisely. And uh, in the background, you see my hospital. It's a 1400 bed uh, university hospital. And uh, it's located in Aachen. And uh, Aachen is uh, very close to the border to the Netherlands, as well as to, the, uh, to Belgium. Uh, so it's uh, in the middle of, it's, quite, it's, it's, it's more or less a heart uh, of uh, Europe where, we are, where I'm living. So uh, it might be that you know that uh, Choosing Wisely initiative uh, started in the United States. And actually it was uh, Howard Brody in uh, uh, 2010 who said, we are using some tests and some treatments much too often. And it might not always provide benefit for the patient, even it might cause harm to the patient. And so he started an initiative uh, and he came up uh, with the idea that uh, all uh, medical specialities should release uh, an article uh, which is stating the top five uh, points where we have in the United States an overuse of uh, tests or treatments. We actually thought in Germany this is a very good uh, initiative, but we modified this uh, a little bit. We thought it would be much better to have, in addition to the five don'ts, five do's, in order to uh, increase the quality and to avoid uh, unnecessary diagnostic and uh, therapies. So in uh, 2017, uh, our society published uh, five positive and five negative recommendations in the field of anesthesiology. 
And three years later, we published uh, five positive and five negative recommendations uh, in the field of intensive care. So both is in the field of perioperative medicine. So I will start with the, and uh, we'll do it a little bit more extensive uh, with the five uh, positive and five negative recommendations in the field of anesthesiology. And in the end, I will briefly uh, go into the field uh, of intensive care. So the first uh, positive recommendation is on the establishment and the usage of safety protocols. And we all know the uh, uh, WHO surgical safety uh, checklist. And this is, I think, a very important uh, step in order to improve the safety of the patient. And here we have the uh, uh, questions we have to ask and the points we have to check before induction of anesthesia. So it's always, is this the right patient? And sometimes indeed you find this is not the right patient. And uh, in order to avoid this error, we have to confirm the identity of the patient. We have to uh, identify uh, whether we would like to do the surgery on the correct site. Is it the right, uh, correct procedure? And have we the consent of the patient? So is the site marked which should be operated? Uh, is the anesthesia machine checked and medication checked complete? Do we have a pulse oximeter uh, on the patient? Does the patient have a known allergy, difficult airway or aspiration risk? And do we have a risk of severe bleeding? And then before skin in, uh, incision, we should uh, check together with the nurse and the surgeon uh, that we know each other. Uh, do we have again the right uh, patient? Does a surgeon know who he is or, uh, doing surgery on? Uh, do we know which procedure uh, should be done and uh, where the incision should be made? And then we check uh, whether the, we have antibiotic prophylaxis used in the last 60 minutes and we uh, anticipate critical events by the surgeon, by the anesthesiologist, by the nursing team. Um, by uh, the technique, whether, for example, we have essential imaging uh, display no, uh, necessary. And at the end, before the patient leaves the operating room, we again check uh, and the nurse verbally confirms uh, the name of the procedure, uh, procedure, whether she has all the instruments, uh, the sponge and the needles, uh, the specimen label, uh, labeling, and whether there is any equipment problems to, to, to be addressed. And uh, we again uh, um, ask all um, people involved, what are the key concerns for recovery and management in order to give this uh, to the next group of treatment, uh, 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 treating the patient. And so we also establish here in Germany, the handover protocols we use for that, the SBAR concept where we check the situation uh, of the uh, patient, it's again name, age, sex, diagnosis, intervention, the type of anesthesia. We check the background of the patient with the allergies, the intraoperative events, skin condition, medication, comorbidities, diagnostics, and the evaluations of the patient. We check um, the assessment uh, of uh, the monitoring, the uh, IV lines, intraarterial lines. So we, we check which uh, volume therapy is uh, to be used. Uh, we, we check whether we will need blood and correlation factors, uh, what happened in the operative phase, uh, what are critical lab values and so on. And then we, at the end, uh, we give some recommendation uh, and some details on the operative uh, procedures, which are the post-operative orders. Uh, should the patient be mechanically ventilation, uh, ventilated on the PECO, IMC or RCU? And what are the key elements of the pain therapy uh, for the patient? Moreover, we established, uh, we have a, as a second uh, positive recommendation in, in order to establish and the use uh, of our prevention team uh, systems. And that's very important. We all know this, uh, that we have a color coding uh, for the syringes. We know all that it's very easy uh, to uh, um, use wrong drugs Many drugs look alike and the, the names sound alike. And so, so it's very uh, important that we have a color coding. And in Europe, uh, it's uh, uh, um, 
uh, unique uh, color coding. So even if we switch from one country to another country, uh, we will find the same uh, color codings uh, for the syringes. Moreover, in uh, order to avoid uh, future uh, errors in the, uh, in the patient, we have to uh, establish interdisciplinary uh, morbidity and mortality conferences. Um, each hospital, each department is using a critical incidence reporting system. And uh, we try to establish, this is not established everywhere, that we get annual reports on perioperative morbidity or mortality of, for each uh, department. The third uh, positive recommendation is uh, to establish patient blood management in each hospital. I think this is also a very good step forward uh, for the patient. Uh, we uh, try to establish diagnostic and therapy of anemia before the patient is entering the hospital. Uh, we try then to optimize the coagulation and the avoidance of iatogenic uh, blood loss. And this includes, for example, very small syringes and not always to take 10 ml of blood for each uh, uh, diagnostic uh, lab value we would like uh, to have. The first positive recommendation was uh, on the uh, active temperature management. We all know that uh, patients are losing heat uh, by evaporation, by radiation, by convection and conduction. Uh, so it's uh, very important to establish here uh, an active temperature management uh, that, uh, because we know that accidental hypothermia causes an increase in mortality, cardiac complication, patient disorders, wound healing disorders, and postoperative uh, shivering. And so uh, we have to establish the measures like uh, pre-warming, increase in OR temperature and active warming using convective or conductive methods. The fifth positive recommendation is uh, uh, to identify risk factors for PONF. We know that uh, risk factors are female gender, non-smoking, history of PONF, post-operative opioids, and we try to calculate a risk uh, um, uh, um, uh, score for that. And then if we find there is a certain risk, uh, then we use uh, prophylaxis. Uh, we use usually ondansetron and dexamethasone in combination. And I would guess that uh, nowadays, because these drugs are very cheap, that we are using it in 80% of all the patients uh, we are uh, uh, dealing with. So what are the, the negative recommendations? I think, uh, um, as mentioned before, uh, the, uh, and that was a hypothesis uh, which the United States uh, came up with, uh, that we are uh, overusing uh, certain diagnostic uh, uh, um, uh, things. And for example, it's quite clear that we are still overusing preoperative lab tests and diagnostic. And so we should try to avoid this and uh, to have uh, uh, rational use uh, of lab tests and diagnostics. The second negative recommendation, and I think this is very important, uh, that we should avoid a decrease of blood pressure in adults. That is uh, to avoid a decrease uh, of uh, mean arterial pressure of uh, lower than 55 to 65 millimeters of mercury. And we know that we have already uh, uh, some um, ha causing some harm if we have a, a blood drop more than 40 to 50 percent of basic uh, systolic blood pressure. And you can see that here in these uh, two pictures, uh, one for acute injury, and here you see the lowest mean arterial blood pressure, and here's the, the probability of acute kidney injury, and here it's the same uh, the lowest uh, pulmonary, uh, mean arterial blood pressure and the probability of myocardial uh, injury. And if you have a blood drop uh, below 55 millimeters of mercury, the, in uh, sorry, the, the, the incidence, um, I have to go back, the incidence uh, of acute uh, uh, kidney injury and the incidence of uh, myocardial injury is increasing. 
So we should try to avoid these uh, blood pressure uh, drops. The question is how should we deal with the blood pressure in neonates and kids? And we know that we uh, have uh, uh, some severe uh, possible, uh, we have the possibility of severe uh, brain damage in these uh, neonates. Uh, and this has uh, described 2014 by uh, McCain. And uh, since then, we are very alert uh, uh, for the blood pressure of neonates and preterms. And uh, the rule is uh, that we should uh, try uh, to achieve at least a mean arterial blood pressure, uh, which is equivalent to the gestational age in weeks. So if uh, the gestational age is, for example, a 13, uh, uh, preterm, then the lowest uh, uh, mean arterial blood pressure should be uh, uh, not less than 30 millimeters of mercury. So this is a very uh, good rule, which which uh, we can work. And the, then if we have term immune burns, the target uh, mean arterial blood pressure should be uh, over 40 millimeters of mercury. If we have small children, it should be uh, more than 50 and school children, children it should be uh, more than 60 millimeters of, of mercury. And it's very clear that uh, you have to try everything to increase the blood pressure if you are going uh, in this range of blood pressure for these groups uh, of uh, kids. The third negative recommendation is uh, that we should avoid uh, RBC transfusion uh, if the hemoglobin value is higher than seven to eight uh, gram per deciliter, and if you have at the same time no sign of an organ ischemia or a massive bleeding. So uh, this has published uh, very often, and uh, I choose to use uh, uh, this recommendation, uh, which has been published 2019 in critical care medicine, and they say, okay, the blood transfusion threshold for sepsis is seven, for upper and lower uh, GE blood bleeds, it's seven. For acute neurological injury or TBI, it's seven. The stable CV uh, 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 cardiovascular disease is eight. If you have uh, acute coronary syndrome, then it might be 10. And PPH is, uh, and the ratio between all the products should be at least one to one to one. But I think it's much better to look for the specific values uh, uh, you need and uh, then to decide whether uh, you have to use FFP or whether you can use only RBC. I think every blood product, what is given uh, too, uh, too much may cause harm uh, in our patients. The fourth uh, negative recommendation is that you should avoid premedication with benzodiazepines in the elderly. And uh, for that, we have a recommendation, a guideline from the European Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care. And they are clearly saying that uh, uh, in order to avoid postoperative delirium, uh, we should uh, um, uh, avoid benzodiazepines for the premedication of the elderly, especially uh, with exception uh, of the very anxious uh, patients. But normally I find uh, it's, it's very easy to convince a patient that he is doing much better without benzodiazepines as uh, if he would get uh, these drugs. And the fifth negative recommendation is uh, that we should avoid uh, routine infusion of color. It's in drug-induced hypertension. We all know that uh, if we uh, are starting our anesthesia and uh, after we have injected uh, some propofol or thiopentyl or whatever we use for induction of anesthesia, we, we very often have a short drop in uh, blood pressure. And I think uh, it's much better to use for that uh, uh, some uh, uh, vasopressors, whatever you are using, uh, instead of uh, um, colloids. Uh, it has been shown that, uh, especially in the field of intensive care medicine, if we are overusing uh, colloids, it might cause harm to the patient. So to sum up uh, the positive recommendations again, are the please establish and use safety protocols, establish and use error prevention systems, 
establish patient blood management, including diagnostic and therapy of anemia, coagulation, optimization, and avoidance of uh, iatrogenic blast loss, establish and use active uh, temperature management, and identify risk factors for post-operative uh, uh, um, um, for, um, uh, for PONF and use strategies uh, to minimize PONF. And the negative recommendations avoid unnecessary pre-operative lab uh, tests and diagnostic, avoid blood pressure decreases, avoid RBC transfusion if hemoglobin level is high enough, avoid pre-medication with benzodiazepines, and avoid routine infusion of colloids in drug-induced hypertension. So very briefly, I would uh, like to report uh, about the Choosing Wisely initiative in surgical intensive care in, uh, in, uh, in, in our country. So again, we have five positive and five negative recommendations. And uh, the five uh, do's are uh, first establish daily interdisciplinary and multi-professional rounds uh, uh, with uh, defined aims for the days. This has been very often shown uh, that this is uh, very valuable for the patient and this uh, is in favor, is in benefit uh, for the patient. Establish severe infection and sepsis strategies to identify, identify the focus. And if you find the focus treated within the shortest possible time span, it should be less than six hours. It's absolutely clear if you have pneumonia, as uh, for example, as uh, the cause of sepsis, you have to use antibiotics within the first hour. Then for the guidance of volume management, uh, use uh, uh, passive leg raising tests uh, and uh, uh, use uh, uh, capillary refilling time uh, for the uh, lung, uh, for the uh, treatment of ARDS patients, use uh, uh, lung protective ventilation, and to add, if needed, prone position and extracorporeal membrane oxygenation and establish uh, the concept of early mobilization. And this is true not only for the uh, normal working days, this is also true uh, for the weekend, uh, because it has been uh, very well shown that this shortens uh, intensive care time of the patient and is uh, uh, in benefit uh, for the patients. Uh, uh, healing. So what are the five negative recommendations? Uh, the five don'ts. And uh, here I would uh, uh, stress uh, to that you should avoid prolong, prolonged antibiotic uh, prophylaxis. And uh, in, in the last years, uh, we have several publications showing that uh, saline uh, infusion for postoperative IV volume is not as good as balanced uh, crystalloids. So use the balanced crystalloids and avoid uh, saline infusions. Avoid uh, frosomid uh, for prevention uh, of treatment of acute renal failure. It has been clearly shown that this is of no benefit for the patients. Therefore, avoid it. Avoid uh, lab or X-ray diagnostic without any concrete question and don't treat lab values without clinical symptoms. So if you have a, a pathological lab value, look for clinical symptoms. And if you can't find it, uh, most often it's uh, much better to do, to do nothing and to observe it. And then at the end, uh, as we know, it's very important to, to use uh, sufficient hand hygiene and avoid uh, and uh, that uh, you or your team is using uh, this insufficiently. Uh, so uh, start uh, before you are going to every patient, start uh, every time with hunt again, it's very important. So thank you very much uh, for your interest in this talk. Uh, and uh, I'm um, here for questions now. It. I think the connections uh, are bad. Thank you, Prof. Rosen, for a wonderful uh, presentation about. Sorry. Thank you, Prof. Prof. Uh, maybe then in the Q and A, and it's in the Q and A. Uh, your topic is very. Can you hear me now? Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, 
the, for the key and a for the questions and answers mm, because i have to mention at unlimited time uh, for those participants who want to uh, ask questions please write down in the qa and prof can answer that in the qa uh, and uh, this is a very interesting topic actually because what are we doing is what you have mentioned overuse of lab overuse of uh, 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 does not diagnostic lab and so on. So uh, this is very interesting that we should uh, aware of this situation and apply what the Prof. Wolf has mentioned. So uh, I think uh, we can proceed with a second. Thank you, Prof. Wolf. We can proceed with a second speaker, uh, Prof. Pedro Giro. Giro is. Uh, Topic is manage, managing anxiety in pediatric, pediatric anesthesia, and that's very interesting uh, topic because uh, surely uh, pediatric patients have high level of anxiety, especially uh, the lower the age, the more uh, anxiety, especially anxiety in separation, parental separation. So your time, uh, your time uh, for you. Please give, give your presentation, Prof. Pedro. Thank you very much for your invitation. I hope you're hearing me well, okay? Yes. Yes, okay. So. Okay, so. Um, this is where I work and this is what I usually do. So I work with head and neck surgery. Sorry, no, I think you have to put it in uh, full screen mode. Oh, yes, here it is. Yeah, yeah, yes. Is it okay? Okay. Yes. So this is where I work. I work in this um, hospital in Porto, in Portugal, the country of Cristiano Ronaldo. And this is what I do usually. I work for head and neck surgery, uh, especially for, for EMT. EMT and also a little bit for remote locations. But it's especially on ENT that I have children. I have many children to anesthetize. And so the main focus of my um, daily practice when I'm speaking about children is on ENT, as we are going to see next. I have no conflicts of interest on this matter. So when we are talking about perioperative medicine, we are always talking about trying to improve quality. It's, it's uh, important to ask ourselves, what are we trying to accomplish when we want to improve? How will we know that a change is an improvement? And what change can we make that will result in improvement? So when we are addressing this topic, the anxiety in children, we must keep in view that why is it a good thing to try this? Why must we accomplish this? Anxiety is something that we see very often in children, as you all know, because of parent separation, um, child, children cannot understand really what's going to happen. So usually there are some kind of reactions that are not only uh, disturbing for everyone that is working on the field, but also as, as we are going to see, they are not good for the children. Anxiety, you can, maybe you can say that you can define it by crying, by having tears in the eyes, the, ch the children that, that they turn the head away from the mask, they don't want to, to accept the mask. They say no, they, they, they say things trying to avoid the doctors and the nurse to get near them. And sometimes it's not easy because as you know, some parents, they really are not a good help sometimes. So anxiety is a problem that we must address to get the anesthesia done and to do it well. And this is not without reason because if we're going to see why is it necessary to control anxiety? In fact, many data on literature tells us that there are 
this results anxiety, excessive anxiety results in post-operative behavioral changes. So many children may, may develop nocturnal fears, bedwetting, feeding problems, and so on and so on. So many observations tell us that the post-operative behavioral changes are important and are not uh, good for the children. For us as an institute, it's important to see that um, anxiety may prolong the induction of anesthesia. This is to say that we must use more anesthesia to get children to sleep. And of course, this will uh, increase the risk of anesthesia. Also, anxious children will have stronger post-operative post pain. And another problem also is the confusional syndromes, also called delirium, that they may develop on the recovery room. And finally, there is a neurohumoral stress response. In fact, uh, factors like pain, surgery, cold, infection, all these can be reduced if you can reduce the preoperative anxiety in children. There are some factors that we know that affect the level of anxiety. You must note that every child is different. Everyone that works in this area very easily can see this. And um, so it must be, must be always an individual approach. And children from one to five years are the most highly exposed to have strong preoperative of course, we will we should emphasize that premedication substantially reduces anxiety. But sometimes it's not always easy or it's not always available. But of course, premedication is one of the most important things to look after. But it's not only premedication. There are also at least three more things that we must address. First of all the preparation of parents. This can be, um, uh, must be started on the preoperative period. So if you have the possibility of, of, um, of having a meeting with them, that would be perfect. As you know, many times those are ambulatory children. So you cannot do this. You have a very limited amount of time just before the surgery to address this problem. Anyway, even in a small amount of time, you can prepare the parents, giving them information, and you can prepare the children, giving them information, but another kind of information, of course, because they are not in the same level as their parents. We have some stress reduction strategies that we are going to see just uh, after this uh, slide. And of course, the premedication. The premedication usually midazolam, as we're going to see. When we are talking about non-pharmacological methods of reducing anxiety, as I told you, we are talking about providing information. So this is what we can call the educational approach. Also, we, want to, we are trying to change the attitude of the children toward us. So what we can say, it's a behavioral approach. There's another thing that we can use. It's the parental presence at induction. This is very controversial. Here in my country, this has been approved two years ago as a, a right for the parents for being there. It was very controversial because in fact, there are no real proofs that this improves the situation. It depends, it, it depends on, on the child, it depends on the parent as we're going to see. And lastly, also, there are some alternative methods like music, video games, in fact, things that may distract the, ch the child and so relieve the anxiety. As a general <clears throat> view of this problem, so the perioperative anxiety in children um, can be relieved with, as I told you, with educational approaches, behavioral approaches, 
pharmacological interventions like midazolam or other um, pre-operative pre medicines. And uh, these alternative approaches like music and other things. So what we want is to get a better outcome interoperatively with analgesic recurrence that uh, could be reduced, anesthetic recurrence that best could be reduced, and postoperatively, as I told you, the clinical outcomes improve if you have reduced levels of anxiety in children. Is there a way to predict which children are going to be more anxious and which children are going to have problems in the post-operative period? In fact, those colleagues from, uh, from, uh, from this uh, publication, they try to get a kind of a questionnaire that you, that you can do to try to see if the children are really prone to anxiety. Um, so this kind of questions that like, if they have a previous experience, a previous bad experience in hospitals, if children, if the, the child in particular is, is not easy for, for them for going to sleep, if he's an irritable child, so if he's disobedient, a few psychological approaches to, to, to see what kind of child we have. As I've been telling you, the first thing that we always think of is sedative premedication, either midazolam, orally, clonidine, ketamine, some may use it too. The second thing, parental presence and addition of anesthesia. And the third one, the non-pharmacological approaches. For, with these non-pharmacological approaches, sometimes we call it distraction techniques. In fact, someone might, might say, if we have midazolam, if we have drugs, why to use non-pharmacological approaches? In fact, it's very important to do them because it's, it's an, uh, the premedication, midazolam and all the other drugs, they are sometimes unpredictable. So, and it's not always easy to get the children to do it right. So it's always better to have a nice relation with the children for allaying anxiety. And sometimes uh, this, this uh, anesthetist su suggests that a funny thing happens. Well, every one of us anesthetists, we have our own way of dealing with children and of coping with them. So I will tell you lately, late, later, I will tell you my receipt for doing that, but it's important to keep in mind that having a good relation with the child and using some kind of distraction techniques to distract them from the stress of being at the operating room is very important. I'm going to give you an example for uh, getting this to reality. And I'm talking a little bit about this, this example, tonsillectomy or adenotonsillectomy. You know, during the, the last century, uh, it was the most frequent surgery in the world. So it was the most frequent anesthesia in the world. Everybody does this by millions. In fact, on the last years, you can see here, on, the, on this, this uh, picture from 1970 to the, the end of the century and the beginning of the 21st century. In fact, it has been reducing the tonsillectomy and then the tonsillectomy. It's not as popular as it was. Still, it's very frequent. So if you get this example, it's important to see a few things. For instance, for the anxiety of the children, it's very important if you can get to, to choose between an intravenous or an inhalational induction. If you have an, an intravenous induction, of course, you must get the child 
punctured first. You have you must have a, an intravenous excess, of course. And this is not always easy because such, uh, most of the children, uh, especially the youngest ones, they resist and it's really hard sometimes to get them with an intravenous access when they are still awake. On the other hand, if we have an inhalational approach for beginning the anesthesia, that may be better because they tend to use to, to accept the mask better. This is a debate, this is a pro-con debate between which one is better. And I have no answer for this. There are indications for intravenous induction, indications for inhalation induction. Most pediatric anesthetists will use both. Um, so as a conclusion, I can say that you can use science, science where possible, but also you must take in account the personalized feelings of everyone involved. For me, I must uh, uh, confess that I ask the children if they have some kind of preference, if they are in the age they can, if they can choose. But in the younger ones, I really think that the mask, it's a better way for them not to being so anxious, you see? Because on my experience, um, the stress that occurs when they are punctured and when they are awake in, for having an intervision, intravenous induction is really, really high. So this is another way of putting it. Inhalation anesthesia remains by far the most commonly used technique. It's the most popular. We may ask, would TIVA, would intravenous become the routine choice in the future? It's debatable. There are some points supporting inhaled anesthesia. Namely, it's easy without an intravenous access. It's quicker, it's simple, it's pain-free if you use the mask. Of course, some people would say, well, it's not very safe to get them anesthetized without the intravenous access. Well, there's always a risk in everything and there is nothing that it's done in anesthesia that it's without some kind of risk. The other thing that I would like to address from my experience when I do tonsillectomy anesthesia it's the parental presence. This is a very debatable thing. Some parents would like to go into the operating room. Some parents would not like to go. For us as the doctors, in general, it's not very nice to have them there. From my experience, some, ch some children, they tend to behave badly if the parents are there. It's better for me to cope with the children alone. There, this is, there is this article, this Cochrane database article, and they try to see on many, uh, on many um, articles that were published, what about the parental presence? So some of them saying no reduction, no clear, others nuclear no differences, other is less effective than sedative medication, and another one, there's no significant difference either one parent or two parents were present. So in general, literature tells us that it's, it's not really that um, effective to have the parents there. So as a conclusion, I would say in this, in this uh, topic that parents should not be encouraged to be present, but maybe they should not be ac actively discouraged from being present because some parents are really attached to the children and they sometimes, if they are psychologically well fit for this, they can help. I would like also to tell you what my way, my practical way of allying anxiety on this um, kind of surgery. Because it's very important to get the cooperation of the children. That's the most important thing for uh, allying anxiety. I will tell you a few things that I do. So this is kind of my receipt. 
I hope that you can get some good ideas for your practical approach for this. And the first one would be, do not treat children as babies, because children, um, let's, let's say from two years up, and when we are doing this kind of intervention of ENT intervention, that's what we get, it's two years up. Children are not babies. I mean, they understand a few things. So it, it should be important to address them as children, not as babies. So don't change your voice. So be nice, but don't change it because they are not babies. And you should be very simple and clear. Sometimes they don't really understand the full meaning of what you are trying to say. If you tell them we are going to make a surgery, of course, they are not going to understand uh, that that would be a bad thing for them. That would create anxiety. But if you, if you can tell them we are going to do some kind of treatment and many children do this treatment is a very easy treatment this is something that they can understand easily. So you can tell them the truth, but tell them the truth that they can understand. So be nice to them, not too nice, as I told you, but be strict, be firm. Do not ask permission to do things, just show them the way. So we, sh we shouldn't tell, uh, are we going to do this? May we do this? it's difficult for them to, to make a choice on a ground that they don't know what really is going to happen. You just say, now we are going to do this because this kind of, of um, uh, strict and firm approach works much better with children. So if you can show the masks to the child and just explain how it works, if you can tell them, you're going to put this on your nose, you're going to, to feel some kind of of, of strange scent, this will um, uh, work good. To say things like many children do this every day is a treatment for getting better and, and reassure them that, that they will be back to their parents immediately after. I would say this lots of times. And I will let the children stay with the mask, play with it for like two or three minutes to get used to the idea. And another important thing is to follow the script. Once you have uh, developed a nice way of doing all this, just follow the script because most of the children will, will accept this on a similar way. Just for curiosity, this is what I do as a, as a, a regular set of drugs for the, for the tonsillectomy anesthesia. So, and you can see some examples of mild children and uh, what I do to them. And I always try to get their cooperation with the mask. It's a nice way of allowing anxiety and it's a nice way to convince them, to persuade them that they are cooperating with us, that they are doing their part of the job. And also that they are doing what all the other children are able to do. I always show these pictures on my mobile phone to them. The children like a lot to see the mobile phone. So if you have a few pictures like those ones from other children and you show, that, show, show them on your mobile phone, it's surprisingly, it's quite surprising how they will accept it. You can try it. It's really, really, it really works well. So as a conclusion, I would say that anxiety is a human reaction to any unknown situation, as you know. But anxiety triggers a physiologic stress response that it's not good. It's not good for the perioperative period. It's not good for the post-operative period because anxiety increases the need for anesthesia and which in turn increases anesthetic risk. It's not as easy to do the induction. It increases the post-operative pain medication requirements, and it increases the risk of infection by decreasing the immune system response. Uh, there is a music from Bob Marley, a very well-known music that says, don't shed no tears, 
No Woman, No Cry. Some of you must, uh, must know that this music is quite an old music from when I was young. And in this, in this, in this um, addressing this anxiety topic in children, I would say no children, no cry. That in fact should be our objective and to address the anxiety problem in children, not only with pre-medication, but also with your presence, with your psychological approach of this and getting a good relation with the child and with their parents, it's very, very important. So this is a topic that you we really should care for and it's a, a good thing to do. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Your tips and recipe for handling patient with uh, pediatric patient with anxiety, and maybe we can try what you have mentioned in our uh, patient. And before we continue for the third speaker, uh, for Prof. Uh, Pedro and Prof. Rolf, there are two questions in the Q&A, yes. and you may uh, answer I, them. I will, ask, I will answer them. So uh, we can continue, and if there are time at the end of the of all speakers, we, we may have a Q&A, but we'll see then. Uh, for the fourth, uh, for the third, Speaker, uh, Prof. Peter Biro. Uh, the uh, topic is anesthetic uh, consideration in international uh, interventional bronchoscopy or airway endoscopy, and this is a very interesting uh, topic because we don't like to share airway with other uh, profession when when doing anesthesia, <laughs> right? Right. This this, this is the real problem. Do you hear me, everybody? Is it everything okay? Yes, yes. Okay, okay so then I uh, open my screen and uh, uh, gonna start the presentation. Do you have full screen image now? Yes. Okay. So the news with me is that since six weeks, I went to pension, I am retired, so I don't have a hospital building to show. I can show only the house where I am right now, and I'm sitting behind that window. This is my institution from where I give this lecture. So uh, we will talk about all these topics, what is in the airway pathological, why there is a need of interventions, what kind of interventions are done, how to evaluate the patient before doing anesthesia, pharmacological remedication, and then we go into the real thing, the sharing of the airway with the surgeon, how I would recommend to do the anesthesia. So what can you find pathological in the airway? And I just show three of very many more um, uh, pathological findings at the level of the larynx, which is, let's say, the most common thing in uh, ENT endoscopy, surgical endoscopy. And you can imagine they are all conflicting with your tracheal tube. There is no way around. So uh, this is the main issue. So we have uh, pathologies of the vocal cords and the larynx of very different kinds, which also change the appearance of the airway, and thus again can produce difficulties with the management of that airway. Then uh, more serious are uh, narrowings especially if they are in the trachea, for example, here the subglottic uh, region as a reaction of scarring after tracheostomy. It's quite uh, common. And these patients breathe quite normally, but uh, as soon as the narrowing arrives at around 70, 80% uh, is obstructed, then they start to have also breathing problems. And you can imagine now to open this up, this is even less space in the competition between surgeon and anesthesia. Then we also find uh, foreign bodies to have to be removed typically in children uh, and um, to, to the technical problem of the airway management and anesthesia, we have all the other problems which Pedro Girao just mentioned before. So this is also a very complex um, uh, topic. 
There are many types of endoscopic intervention in the upper airway and the most basic, the most simple and also one of the most efficient one is the straight laryngotracheoscopy with a specific laryngoscope for surgery. This is not a laryngoscope for intubation, but can be used in emergency cases. Here is the so-called Hollinger handheld endoscope. And uh, if you see here the blade, it is a closed uh, tube. So one can make an intubation, but uh, then how to, to remove the device? What is a possibility in the worst case when you are in danger of losing the airway is to introduce a bougie, then to remove the endoscope, and then you can railroad the tracheal tube. So this is one of the very efficient ways to save uh, endangered airway. Then very common and still very useful is rigid bronchoscopy, although many endoscopies have been taken over by flexible instruments, which are, because they are flexible, maybe easier to manipulate, but the straight uh, bronchoscope opens up many more possibilities. And in particular, uh, one can uh, enter through an open endoscope, many, many other instruments and, and do the work, so especially in the removal of foreign bodies. This is the most excellent device. But of course, again, how to ventilate such a patient? You will see there are some possibilities. Let's say the most classical and most uh, used technique is the so-called suspension laryngoscope. It's actually an, an, um, an augmented device, an uh, augmented held, handheld device, which is suspended on the thorax uh, on the, of the patient. So the surgeon has his both hands free. And again, the question is how to ventilate if such a, a device is in place. It takes a lot of place, but it is still possible. And there are various ways to get around with our ventilation. Uh, here, a specific uh, in addition to uh, suspension laryngoscope, uh, sorry, laryngoscopy is the use of laser. As soon as you use laser, you have additional questions of burning, of introducing a hot temperature and fire uh, risk into the airway. You see here in this uh, upper image, uh, I don't know if you see my mouse, here is a huge tumor down the trachea, a little bit above the carina, which is obstructing 90% of the airway. And still the patient could breathe uh, normally, but he of course couldn't make any efforts. And you see here the probe with the laser burning into the tumor, and this is at the end of the procedure. So one of the very interesting characteristics in, in uh, this kind of intervention is that the patient after the operation breathes much better than before. So, and this helps us of course, with the critical phase of emergence from anesthesia. Uh, another technique which is very well established is flexible endoscopy, of course, which also can be used in a certain way to intubate the patient for endobronchial biopsies and even sonography. So here again, the question, how to ventilate a lung of this kind when a big part of the upper airway is occupied by a thick uh, sonography probe, but it is possible and we have done it many times. And maybe one of the most challenging situation is when you have to in, introduce or manipulate a stent. These are so-called extendable stents, which are introduced with an endoscope and they just uh, how should I say, inflate themselves. And then it looks like this here on the right side. Again, how you introduce, how you manipulate, how do you get it out to exchange it maybe if necessary when you have to ventilate. So we will speak about different possibilities for us anesthesiologists to, to assure ventilation and uh, securing of the airway. But one thing is absolutely essential. It is a constant dialogue with the surgeon necessary. And I also insist when I did in the past, this kind of anesthesias, that the surgeon is from the very beginning in the operation room, even 
during induction, because one never can know when everything collapses or we have a problem, and then I need his skills to open up the airway. Let's say the, um, the most uh, highest uh, art in airway surgery is the sleeve resection of the trachea. You know, you can imagine you even disrupt the continuity of the airway. And here is not only the question how to bypass this disruption for ventilating the patient, but you don't have any more uh, a seal of the airway, except you can pass a tracheal tube further inferiorly, further distally, and block it there. But sometimes the problem is at the carina, and then it is really difficult because this needed to make such complex reconstructions of the tracheobronchial branching. And during this surgery, with all these intricate sutures, it is not easy to maintain the ventilation. And uh, as a, another field of uh, airway intervention is operations on already existing tracheostomata. And there are two different types. Some are connected with the um, with esophagus and the pharynx, and some are not connected as here. If they are completely separated, for example, after an, uh, a re 